When I think of Ernie Pyle, many things come to mind. Compassion is the first word that comes to mind. I would definitely use dedicated and persistent. A superb reporter, uh, war correspondent. A great American writer of the early part of last century. Hello, my name is Jerry Mashino, and I'm the executive director of the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation. The foundation was established to continue and ensure the legacy of Ernie Pyle. As you may know, Ernie was the famous World War II correspondent that was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his outstanding journalist style. In doing so, we established National Ernie Pyle Day on August 3rd, his birthday, and held a national event in 2018 to honor Ernie. As we look to the future, the foundation chose to continue this tradition and hold a National Ernie Pyle Day event every year. This year, in lieu of an in-person event, we've chosen to create a tribute video to honor Ernie. This tribute includes interviews with friends and historians, as well as spoken excerpts from some of his columns. We hope you enjoy this effort, but more importantly, we hope you may also reflect on how all of us can bring Ernie's legacy into the future. Ernie Pyle worked for Scripps Howard and he was a, a correspondent. He was their aviation correspondent. And he also, uh, traveled the country with his wife, Jerry, and wrote articles about different places in the country. In the columns that he wrote while crisscrossing the United States, as well as Canada, and North and South and Central America, he was telling um, the story of America to itself uh, in a way that people had not done before. Pyle was able to um, preserve uh, an important part of American history uh, with a group of people that came to um, epitomize the struggles of, that were going on in the, in the mid 20th century. When I think of Ernie Pyle, the first memory that comes to mind for me is traveling freshman year with my cohort of Ernie Pyle scholars to his home in the historical site up in Dana, Indiana. One story that's kind of remote that a lot of people would not have heard of was when he was um, back home visiting, and he was in his late 30s before World War II. I don't know what it is, but nature is pulsing this spring, and there is a thriving of life in the country around our home. The grass and trees have never seemed so beautiful to me, so fresh and so green. The spirea bushes are out in a wild white, and if you weren't hot with spring warmth, you'd swear that the bushes were covered with snow. All the animal and bird life is growing too, Never were the quails so abundant. And as I walk through the country, it seems to me the grass and bushes are alive with birds. Birds I've never seen before. Birds I don't know the names of. New birds in our country. Nature is afoot again in our farmed and paved and tractored country. I don't know what it is. The farmers don't know what it is. There's a new birth of something. People in the Great Depression and in, in World War II didn't get to travel much. So particularly for Ernie, being one of the traveling reporters, uh, they read his stuff to see what they were not going to be able to go do. There's something I think really powerful about his, Ernie's ability to live that life and then give it language. Legacy, I think, is what a person or an institution for that matter uh, leaves to future generations. Uh, in the case of Ernie Pyle, I think there are two parts. Um, one is you simply cannot tell the story of World War II without Ernie Pyle. The second thing is he was a first-rate writer. Pyle was always somebody who found uh, the extraordinary within the ordinary. He was uh, one who celebrated the, um, uh, the great accomplishments that were being done by people like you and me, people that were just uh, sort of the, the, the average folk uh, out in America. He was a poet. 
um, in a way that lots of other war correspondents just weren't. And what I mean by that is the stories that he told and the language that he used, it, it really cut through the conventions of war reporting. And it revealed to people back home the heart and the soul of, of war. He was a truth seeker. And, uh, and he focused his spotlight on the privates and corporals, the, the lower end of the enlisted men who carry out all of the fighting. Pyle, probably better than any other uh, reporter, was able to uh, document that the day-to-day -day lives uh, and the interests and passions uh, and, and relationships that these people had. He ate with them, he marched with them, he was cold with them, he suffered with them, he slept in the foxholes. That is an incredible commitment for a journalist to make, especially when it would not have been expected. He was really just focused on the six feet in front of him and the people around him and what they were feeling and going through. There is an almost irresistible pull to get close to somebody when you are in danger. In spite of themselves, the men would run up close to the fellow ahead for company. They weren't heroic figures as they moved forward one at a time, a few seconds apart. There was a confused excitement and a grim anxiety on their faces. They seemed terribly pathetic to me. They weren't warriors. They were American boys who, by mere chance of fate, had wound up with guns in their hands. They were afraid, but it was beyond their power to quit. They had no choice. They were good boys. I talked with them all afternoon as we sneaked slowly forward along the mysterious and rubbled street, and I know they were good boys. And even though they aren't warriors born to kill, they win their battles. That's the point. He was writing six columns a week, every single week for years and years. Uh, it, it, not only just uh, his war columns, but uh, in all the years preceding that uh, throughout the 1930s. His relatively short columns show how much you can do with a minimum of words. He was writing, oh, between 700 and 950 uh, words a day, and yet each one of them was a story unto itself. He, he never walked around with a notebook, except for writing down people's names and places where he was, and everything else he, you know, put to memory. And he would take some time to fashion the story, and then boom, he'd bust it out. I think sometimes you can read reports that have a lot of detail, but the detail isn't meaningful. It doesn't paint a picture. Not so with Ernie Pyle. Even though it sounded very simple, uh, it was not a very simple task that he was doing. He found ways to name and describe feelings and emotions and experiences that for a lot of people were you know, really difficult um, uh, to describe and to talk about. Another thing too to mention is that his writing, particularly during World War II, could create pictures in your mind. He used um, a device that's called an anaphora and so you know it when you see it because it creates this rhythm that's just unmistakable. Um, and what Ernie did in using that technique was he signaled to his readers that the thing that he was writing about should be remembered. There's one Ernie Pyle column that everybody puts their finger on. And that's uh, the one that he wrote from the Italian front in the mountains, uh, titled The Death of Captain Waskow. The first one came early in the morning. They slid him down from the mule and stood him on his feet for a moment while they got a new grip. In a half light, he might have been merely a sick man standing there, leaning onto the others. Then they laid him onto the ground in the shadow of the low stone wall alongside the road. I don't know who that first one was. You feel small in the presence of dead men and ashamed at being alive, and you don't ask silly questions. We left him there beside the road, that first one, and we all went back into the cow shed and sat on water cans and laid on straw, waiting for the next batch of mules. Somebody said the dead soldier had been dead for four days, and then nobody said anything more about it. We talked soldier talk for an hour more. The dead man lay all alone outside in the shadow of the lone stone wall. 
Then a soldier came into the cow shed and said there were some more bodies outside. We went out onto the road. Four mules stood there in the moonlight in the road where the trail came down off the mountain. The soldiers who led them there stood there waiting. This one is Captain Wasco, one of them said quietly. When he wrote that, Ernie didn't even know if it was a good column, but it was the greatest column he ever wrote. It's been chosen the best column of the 20th century uh, by the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. He takes us right there into the minds and hearts of the soldiers as they see the body of their dead captain. All you have to do to know Ernie Pyle is read that one column. I recommend you read them all, but that one shines like a full moon in the sky. The the passages, the, the articles that, that Ernie wrote that I think stick with people even after all these years are those really poetic, beautiful, columns of his where he used this this language to tell a beautiful emotional story. I think it was just something that was part of the pile style uh, and uh, it was always something that that uh, people back home really appreciated especially in those when those war columns they wanted to know um, uh, not so much about what General Eisenhower was doing or what General uh, Bradley or G uh, General Marshall was do were doing out on the front lines. They wanted to know about their sons, their, their brothers, their husbands. They wanted to know what was happening with those people. He didn't consider himself um, important. He wanted the people's stories to come through. The men are walking. They are 50 feet apart for dispersal. Their walk is slow, for they are dead weary, as you can tell even when looking at them from behind. Every line and sag of their bodies speaks their inhuman exhaustion. They don't slouch. It is the terrible deliberation of each step that spells out their appalling tiredness. Their faces are black and unshaven. They are young men, but the grime and whiskers of exhaustion make them look middle-aged. In their eyes, as they pass, it is not hatred, not excitement, not despair, not the tonic of their victory. There's just a simple expression of being here as though they had been here doing this forever and nothing else. The line moves on, but it never ends. All afternoon, men come around the hill and vanishing eventually over the horizon. It is one long, tired line of ant-like men. In some of the, some of the meetings we had regarding the, the museum, uh, one of the ladies said that Ernie Pyle's generation is passing and that his work doesn't have any relevance today. And my reply was to her that 30 years after Ernie wrote this column about the infantry, I saw the same thing when I was in the infantry in the early 1970s. You know, what Ernie wrote about was, can easily be applied to people who still serve in the military today. With veterans of the war dying off so quickly, we still have Ernie Pyle's writings to tell us um, what it was like. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner. He should be remembered and things like that. And of course, the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation, that's our goal is to bring him out into the public again and people know what a, a great writer he was and how he felt for all the troops. His legacy is out there, it needs to be found, and it is in the writing. When I was working on my piece for the New York Times, kind of say, oh, you're doing a thing on Ernie Pyle? Oh, okay. Do you think anyone's going to know who Ernie is? Well, you know, in the first few days after that story came out, there was over a million views of that story. And I had hundreds of emails from people telling me that their grandfather had met Ernie or they still had a scrapbook that their grandparents had made of all of Ernie's columns. I mean, he really did have a relationship with people and clearly his work has inspired subsequent generations. When I think of the legacy of Ernie Pyle, I recognize uh, his past work as an Indiana Daily student. Um, so when I was elected to be the fall editor, you know, I just know that I'm following in his footsteps a little less than a century later which is something that's very humbling for me as a, as a journalist, as an individual. We're looking for somewhere 
that Ernie Pyle's legacy will have meaning. And uh, we have to invent it. The opportunity to um, celebrate a National Ernie Pyle Day, uh, the ability to produce a documentary, Ernie Pyle, Life in the Trenches, uh, those types of things that uh, we're doing today as a way to help keep uh, Pyle's uh, spirit alive to keep his legacy alive today. I think I think those kinds of things are important. You know, one of the things that stands out to me is that Ernie Pyle was so appreciated for what he did and so beloved by the American people and they really had a sense of connection to him and that he was telling the story of America's children. But I think that we have lost some of that sometimes today and journalists are still out there telling those stories, but I'm not sure that it gets the degree of appreciation that it once did. The profession of journalism is changing drastically right in front of our eyes as uh, daily newspapers are fading away rapidly. And uh, this was what fueled Ernie Pyle's career. Uh, this was what fueled the career of so many of us in what I call the golden age of newspapers. We all read blogs, we all read, you know, short form um, on the internet now. We can do things here over the computer and that's, that's fun too. But we all want to get back to the that human connection that um, Ernie Pyle wrote about so eloquently. So I think that uh, uh, having somebody like Pyle to draw upon uh, as a resource to sort of remind us again how much we have uh, that is the same, that is similar, that is that we share. I think his legacy shows up in how. We have myself and other journalists at uh, the ideas for stories. You know, we're making events, people, and moments in history more personal for people that couldn't experience that firsthand. Um, and that's how I see his legacy showing up in the work I do. You know, as journalists, it's important that we see the human in each of the sources that we talk to. Not just the general, not just the top politician, not just, you know, that person can have a story either to be told or to tell. There's nothing nice about the prospect of going back to war again. Anybody who's been in war and wants to go back is a plain damn fool in my book. I'm certainly not going back because I've got itchy feet again, or because I can't stand America, or because there's any mystic fascination about war that is drawing me back. I'm going simply because there's a war on. I'm a part of it, and I've known all the time I was going back. I'm going simply because I've got to, and I hate it. What Ernie Pyle really brought to the table was a focus on the daily lived experience of the folks who were in the front lines. And so when you read, especially some of the very evocative and well-remembered pieces. Uh, he was there and part of that. And that then also really affected how we see war coverage in later wars. Now, how they cover those wars has to remain the same. It has to be that pursuit of the truth about war and the people who fight those wars which Ernie Pyle pursued better than anyone else I've ever known. Yeah, you know, newspapers and magazines and media have changed. Lots of newspapers have shut down foreign bureaus. Lots of war correspondents are not working full-time. They're freelancing. They're doing pieces for lots of different places. We've come to a, a, just a wholly different place in the history of journalism. We have to find out who's going to cover our wars, who's going to send the Ernie Piles out there to tell the stories of the soldiers and Marines, sailors and airmen.
the way he covered soldiers who may not have felt like they were wanted back at home and who made their stories more personal. Um, and that's something that we today as journalists really need to do. You know, imagine if Ernie Pyle were covering the COVID-19 crisis. Where would he go? He'd go probably to the hospitals. There would be the same kind of heroes there of that he covered in a trench in, you know, Europe or in Japan, uh, taking the same risks. But if we had more and more of that kind of coverage, we might understand the current crisis better. I think so if you, you, you can, I think you can apply that journalistic ethos uh, to, to any situation we find ourselves in. The crises of today, be they about a virus, be they about uh, racial conflict, they do all have front lines. I also think another great way to remember Ernie's legacy is just to support journalism with either any way you can, you know, by subscribing, with financial contributions. I think that that's also um, a great way to honor his legacy. We need to have people on the ground telling these stories because it's important, because we need to know what's happening. Um, and I just, I don't think that the kind of work that Ernie did during World War II, I don't think it could be easily replicated right now, just because of how little support there is. Most of us, you know, if we're honest, won't have that kind of impact. We will have done good things with our life and then you know, we will have been forgotten by history. So to make that kind of impact, to have people even remember your name and know who you were, that's a legacy. That's an amazing achievement. He really saw himself as a part of the war effort. Uh, he saw himself as, as an officer, right, in the army, and that it was his job to tell the stories. Ernie can do it in a thousand words or less. You can put an entire story in a perfect form. I really would challenge people to go back and read some of Ernie Pyle's columns. I think that's what they need. They don't really need us to interpret Ernie Pyle for them. His words are as powerful today, all of these 80 years later. For us here at the media school, obviously Ernie Pyle's legacy is, it will be everlasting whether it's a, a, a statue of him in front of our building, um, the pictures that you can see in our hallways of how he worked here uh, is something that will, will never go away. Ernie Pyle himself would simply have loved to see journalists carrying out their craft with the same diligence and care and perception and dedication that he did. And I honestly think like that that's his legacy. Hello, thank you for watching this video to celebrate National Ernie Pyle Day. My name is Joe Galloway. I spent 55 years as a reporter and writer and editor and covered a lot of wars and many, many battles in everywhere from Vietnam to uh, Iraq. Hi, and uh, I'm David Christinger. I wear many hats. Uh, one hat uh, I wear is I direct the writing program at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Uh, I also do some uh, freelance journalism for the New York Times at War Blog and for the War Horse. I teach writing to military veterans and their families. Um, but most relevant to our discussion today, I'm writing a book about Ernie Pyle's reporting from World War II, um, where I'm actually retracing his steps through the war. And uh, that'll be out with, uh, out from Penguin Press in hopefully the spring of 2022. Well, we're here to discuss Ernie Pyle's journalism. And the first topic I'd like to bring up is to talk about his specific style of writing. 
And since you're deep into research on uh, Ernie Bile, would you like to kick this off? Sure. The the thing that really struck me first when I started reading Pyle's reporting was the interesting ways he was able to talk about really difficult and sometimes traumatic experiences that he had. He was able to write about them in a way that wouldn't upset the military censors, wouldn't turn away his readers back in the States, uh, but still gave those folks at home, as he called them, um, a better understanding of what the average soldier was experiencing. Joe, did you read Pyle's columns before you became a reporter or during your early years in reporting? Was he like a, a model that you followed at all? I read Ernie Pyle's collected columns in a book at my uncle's house when I was probably 10 or 11 years old. Mm. And I, I, I really thought, you know, if, if I become a journalist and my generation has a war, I want to cover that war. And I want to cover that war the way Ernie Pyle covered his war. You know, I, I have friends who have been war correspondents. And when I talk to them about Ernie, it always comes back to there just aren't the resources and the support anymore to do the kind of work that Ernie did. And so when I, when I think about like, well, how can we keep Ernie's legacy going? It always turns back to what well, we need to invest in journalism, right? We need yeah, exactly. To, we need to pay for the news that we read. We, we live in a world today that is so complicated and threatening and yet we know less and less and less about that world because our eyes and ears are not there anymore. There's one thing I tell my students at the public policy school um, all the time, which is data can't speak for itself. That's, that's the mantra that, you know, I, I need it tattooed somewhere. <laughs> because there, there's this idea that if we just get more information, more data, more evidence, that everything will make sense, right? We'll, we'll all sort of see the same thing and it's just not true. It's not true. And, and I, wanna, I wanna show the students in my, you know, my teaching and my own writing that you still need someone to tell a story about what the data and the evidence show. You know, I, I use Ernie Pyle in my policy writing class um, because I, I say, you know, if you wanna, if you want to write something where your reader is going to finish it and they're going to say, yeah, that sounds logical or that seems correct, that's fine. But if you really want to haunt someone, if you really want your piece of writing to stick with them, then you have to tell a story. You got to tell a story. You have to do what Ernie did and what lots of people did, what you did. It's not enough to just present, you know, here, here's the data, um, even if it's correct. <laughs> That's exactly correct. And, uh, you know, storytelling is almost a lost art. There are too few of us left. And I'm hoping that, that the example of Ernie Pyle and your teachings and your book will uh, light a little fire under some of them and uh, maybe we can breed some new storytellers. Now, we, we need to get to the end of this thing. And that is the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation has developed a series of awards that will be given out each year to celebrate National Ernie Pyle Day. One of these awards in particular fits in well with the subject of this video, which is Ernie Pyle's legacy. The Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation honors the recipient's work and bestows the award upon the journalist who published the best article 
Defining Ernie Pyle's Legacy. On behalf of the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation, I have the honor of presenting the 2019 Ernie Pyle Legacy Award to David Christinger. Congratulations. Oh, you're kidding. What? Yeah, you got it. You got what it. Is, I, I did not know this was happening. This is fantastic news. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. You should be. And I'm told that they're going to mail it to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll keep my eyes out for it. Thank you for taking part in this tribute to Ernie Pyle's legacy. The foundation has established an annual Ernie Pyle Legacy Award for outstanding journalism that embodies Ernie Pyle's writing style. This award is important as it helps inspire the future of journalism to write with the purpose Ernie had. We want to th sincerely thank those who took the time to share their insights on Ernie's legacy for this tribute. We'd also like to acknowledge members of the Media School at Indiana University, particularly Christina Mercedes, on helping the foundation produce this video. Their help was invaluable. Lastly, we would like to leave you with a personal request. Consider how you can continue the legacy of Ernie Pyle with his unique personal approach to journalism and how you can make a difference. From the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation, we thank you.